It's now time to discuss how we can synchronize multiple processes that are working together, typically on some shared data structures. So in this chapter, we'll first have the background, which is this video. Then we will discuss the critical section problem and Peterson's solution to the critical section problem. We can uh, we will discuss uh, what kind of synchronization hardware is provided in modern computer systems and uh, mutex uh, lux to prevent uh, these problems. And similarly, we will talk about semaphores and then some classic problems uh, about synchronization. We will complete the chapter by discussing the monitors and synchronization examples and finally, briefly discuss some alternative approaches. So first, what are our objectives? We will first be discussing in this video uh, the concept of process synchronization. What do we mean by process synchronization? Uh, then we will be discussing the critical section problem in this context and try to uh, propose solutions for the critical section problem. Some of these solutions will not work properly, so we will discuss why they don't work. Uh, we will then uh, discuss some software and hardware solutions to the critical section problem and examine uh, several classical uh, process synchronization problems and tools to cope with uh, these synchronization problems. So, where does this synchronization problem arise from? The main problem is that processes are executing concurrently. Pay attention, I didn't say in parallel. It could be in parallel if you have multiple cores or multiple processors. But even in a system where you have a single processor and a single core in that processor, remember that due to, uh, due to scheduling like round robin or other scheduler algorithms, that switch from one process to the other before the first one is finished, we can, uh, we can experience the synchronization problem. What we mean is the following. Process P1 is executing in the CPU for some time. Before process P1 is complete, the CPU switches to process P2 and then to process to P3. Then comes back to process P1 P3, P2, P1, P2, P3, whatever, in any order. And also remember that when you run the same system, once again, in that uh, run, it is possible that these processes could be running in a different order. So it's not guaranteed in which order they will be executing. If these processes, P1, P2, and P3, are completely independent, that means the variables they're using, the sh files they're using, if they're not shared, so, uh, then it's not important in which order they are executing. It's just the performance problem. However, if these processes are sharing some data structures, like variables, arrays, or even files, or doing inter-process communication in between, or signaling to each other, it is important in which order they are executing. Since their executions are interleaved, like P1 executes, let's say, 10 instructions, then P2 executes 15 instructions. If it's working this way, what if in the next time I run these programs, this time P1 executes 12 instructions rather than 10, and P2 executes, say, 8 instructions, rather than 15, before going to P3, would this result in a different output? In a stable system, we would not expect different output from the same processes, independent of the order of their executions. What I mean is the following. Assume that you're running a program on the same system as I do. What if the output of your program changes just because not what you're doing, but because what I am doing? 
it, definitely that's not acceptable. So we should come up with solutions that will not cause this to happen. But first of all, why does this happen? That's what we need to understand first. So concurrent access to shared data may result in data inconsistency. This data inconsistency is the one that's causing different output every time you run the programs. And that's what we don't want to have, definitely. And maintaining the data consistency requires that we develop some mechanisms that will ensure that the processes are executed in some specific order, independent of how scheduling is done. So let's consider, consider such a system. Let's assume that we have a consumer process and a producer process. And uh, these are uh, interacting with each other. The consumer and the producer processes are interacting with each other through some buffers. The producer is producing something, uh, some components, for example, and the consumer is using these components. Take it like the producer is like a worker who is producing some items and these items are being placed, let's say, on a shelf. And on the shelf, you have some limited space. Let's say the shelf can take at most 10 items, not more. And also, we're assuming that these items are equivalent to each other. So it's not important for you uh, whether you, you get the seventh or the fifth item. They're the same thing. Okay, It's enough uh, to get one item. So the worker would be the producer process because it's producing the items. And the consumer is the process that's taking the items. And the producer process, when it creates a new item, it's placing the item in the shelf, on the shelf, so that the worker's hands are free, so the worker can produce the next item. Okay, So the producer should get rid of the item in hand by placing the item in the shelf and continue. And the consumers can take the items only from the shelf. They're not able to, they're not allowed to take the uh, items directly from the hands of the uh, producer of the worker. Okay, in such a system, assuming that let's say we have 10 spaces in that shelf, in that buffer, uh, as I said, the producer is placing the items in the buffer and the consumer is taking the items from the buffer. Well, we, we should make sure that the buffer is never empty or it's never completely full. Because if it's empty, when a consumer comes, the consumer will not be able to take an item from the shelf because there is none. So the consumer has to wait. On the other hand, if no consumer has been coming recently and the producer produces items and places them on the shelf and this continues while no consumer comes in or at least the production rate is higher than the consumption rate. In that case, at some point, all the shelf will be full with items and the worker, when he or she produces a new item, there is no place to put that item in the shelf so that the worker can continue with the following, uh, with creating the other items. So we need to keep track of how many items there are in the shelf? Let's say we keep that in an integer variable named counter, which is initialized to zero. So every time an item is produced, counter is incremented by one. And every time it's uh, used, it should be, uh, every time an item is taken from the shelf, it should be decremented by one. So I can write two processes, the producer process and the consumer process like this. Let's first look at the producer process. So this is the function that the worker, for example, is running. 
So the worker is continuously trying to produce items. That's why it's an inf in an infinite loop. So the producer is not stopping. Let's say after he or she produces, let's say, 30 items. So continuously the worker is trying to produce items. So whatever it does to produce those items, all the instructions will be here. Okay, we'll skip that by just putting this comment here. So there will be several statements here to produce the item. So when we come to the while loop here, this inner while loop, we are assuming that the item has already been produced. So let's try to put it in the shelf. But first we should make sure that counter, which is the number of items in the buffer, is uh, not equal to buffer size. If so, that means all of the buffer is full. So the producer should not attempt to put the item in the shelf because there's no such space. That's why there is an infinite loop here. Okay. But in fact, this infinite loop does not go till eternity. Okay. Because as we will see in the next slide, the uh, consumer process, when it takes an item, it's decrementing the counter. So, in other words, it appears like this is an infinite loop, but in fact it's not, because the counter variable is shared between the producer and consumer processes, and hopefully a consumer will come in and remove an item from the shelf, and the moment it happens, the producer can now continue to place the item it has produced into the shelf because when the consumer removes an item, counter will be decremented by one, so it will not be equal to buffer size anymore. But the important thing you should keep in mind here is as long as the buffer is full, the producer process is stuck and waiting here. Okay? It's in the CPU. It's indefinitely checking, making the check for this expression, but still it's not able to go to the next statement until a consumer removes an item. So when there's space in the buffer, uh, the producer will place uh, the uh, item into the buffer at index in which should be, of course, initialized. It's not shown here, but should be originally initialized to zero because you typically from start from the beginning of the buffer, which is index zero. So an item is placed into the uh, buffer at index in, and once it's inserted, in should be incremented by one, but we're using this buffer space in a circular manner. That means you place the items at index 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 9. Okay. And then come back and uh, use again from it's starting from index 0. Meanwhile, while, you're pro while the producer is placing items into the buffer, the consumers are also removing items from the buffer. Okay. So if the producer and the consumer are running in some matching rates, then normally you shouldn't have any blanks there. Anyways, after you have done this, you also increment the counter by one. On the consumer side, this time you should ensure that there is something in the buffer. So if there is nothing in the buffer, again, you should go into a loop here until a producer places some item into the buffer and if so you should remove the item from the index out which is also initialized to zero initially and that's what you're allowed to consume and also shift the out pointer by one one position to the right oh, again in a modular manner because this is circular buffer as we mentioned and since you've removed an item from the buffer, you should decrement the counter by one. Now you're free to enjoy the item, the product you have removed from the uh, buffer. And after you have 
consumed it, you will need once again. So again, you come to uh, take one more of that item. Now, unfortunately, this solution does not work well. Because, yes, for example, in C, C++, you have, for example, the increment operator. You can either say counter becomes counter plus one, or you can just use counter plus plus. Okay. But that is a statement in C language. Remember, C is a high level language. At the machine instructions level, this single statement, counter plus plus, is actually implemented in three instructions. You first copy the value of the memory space for the variable named counter into register, let's say R1, then do an addition operation, an incrementation on R1 by taking the value of that register, adding the immediate value of one to that, and putting the result back in register R1. And then it's in the register R1, you should copy it back to the uh, variable in memory, in the main memory. So that is yet the third instruction. Okay, so this is not done, in other words, in a single uh, CPU cycle. It takes at least three uh, machine instructions to execute it. Decrement is similar by just decrementing it. Now, it is possible, but pay attention. I'm not saying it will always happen this way, but there is the possibility of such an execution. Let's say count was initially five, and uh, the producer produces some uh, product, okay, some uh, an item, so it wants to increment counter by one, okay? So how do you do it? You take it to R1, add one on top of that, and put it back to variable counter. So it takes the value from the memory into register R1, it increments it by one, but before copying it back to the uh, memory back to main memory into vari variable counter in the main memory, the scheduler decides to do a context switch between the producer process and the consumer process. Now, I cannot guarantee that this will happen, but it is a possibility. Nobody can prevent the scheduler with the information we have up to now from doing this. So, when this happens, the consumer process will try to decrement it, so it will take the value uh, of the variable counter into register R2. Hey, what was the value of the variable in the memory? It's still five. The updated value in R1 has not been copied into the variable yet because this instruction, the third instruction here, has not been executed yet. So it will take into R2, the value five, decrement it by one, four, then again a context switch, let's say, to the producer process. So it will copy the value of register R1 to the memory, so it will become six. But then, when we have a context switch back to the consumer process, that will take it back to four. Now, this is strange. It was five. You produce one, consume one, so it should still be five. But unfortunately, it's now four. This is the data inconsistency we were mentioning here. Okay? Because the data is now corrupted. It's not what it should be. 